Okay, uh, we're missing one panelist, but we're going to get started because I know everyone is short on time. Um, I'm Rich Greenfield. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the panel is all about really uh, what I consider to be one of the most interesting topics of media, which is kind of the future of the bundle. And the panel titled The Great Unbundling and the Mass Rebundling. It's interesting, Benedict Evans calls this kind of the double helix effect, is that all types of media kind of bundle and re-aggregate back together. Uh, because going it alone is, is, is very, very challenging, and there's a natural de human desire for bundling. We have great panelists. We have one more that's going to join us shortly. Uh, let me just introduce them really quickly. Uh, I'm not going to go through backgrounds because you have that, but to my left uh, is Amit Ziv, uh, who is at Epix. We have Dave Gandler of FUBU TV to his left, and then um, Rajib Shah uh, over at Univision, Reggie Shaw, I should just say, over at Univision. Uh, at the far left, and Jamie Wilkinson from VHX, uh, which is now part of Vimeo, is going to be joining us shortly. Um, you know, I think anytime you talk about bundling, we live in a world where the traditional, I think everyone in this room probably is used to seeing a traditional TV bundle. It comes with hundreds of channels. It used to come with four or five channels. Now it comes with hundreds of channels. There is not a lot of flexibility. It comes with the same remote control you've had for a decade an on-screen menu that looks very similar to what it looked like a decade or two decades ago. Uh, very different than the experience of if everyone picked up their cell phone and thought about what a cell phone was like 10 years ago. We were probably all sitting in this room with razors, uh, <laughs> pink or gold or black. And you think about just how dramatically cell phone technology has changed, and yet the media consumption experience really hasn't changed. We're all essentially 90 plus million people out of 100 million households are still consuming media content, uh, broadcast and cable network channels, very similar to the way they were a decade ago. And so I think whenever you talk about the bundle, one of the things that I think always gets left out, and I want to start with it, which is what does the consumer actually want? And why don't we start with Reggie, because he's done research. Um, he does research at Univision. What do you think consumers actually want? They want their content. They it, it's, it is all about the content. They will chase whatever bundle necessary uh, to, to get the content they're looking for. Um, and secondly, they want it now and they want it convenient. They want it convenient to them. And how do they know what they want? Because I would argue you, nobody knew they wanted UGC from YouTube until they found YouTube. Nobody knew. You know, I think about uh, when I was growing up, I remember <coughs> HBO being a brown box that had a red and black button on it for HBO on or HBO off to go back to traditional television. Um, nobody knew they even needed HBO back then. And so in many ways, you don't know what you want until you actually discover it. Right. So I think as we move away from the linear channelized experience, um, we're going to see, they're going to see what they want based on the recommendation engines. And that's going to be huge as we move away from channel two, channel three, channel four, which as you said, we're still consuming as we have for the past 40, 50 years. You're part of the cable network ecosystem sure. that currently exists today. Yep. How does Epix, what does Epix think consumers want? Consumers want flexibility, they want choice, they want access to our 3,000 titles on demand, or they want access to our big movies via our linear channels. It's about choice. Uh, I think the roadblock at the end of the day, as we all know, less for us as a subscription for service, but uh, for some basic cable nets especially, it's a rights issue, and the consumers don't have transparency into the deals, and legacy deals are what prohibit uh, consistent experiences across platforms, and I think that's been some of the challenges on the TV Everywhere front. Uh, aside from a product issue. Can I get Epix on every platform now? Is there any platform that isn't available to uh, me? Uh, you can get Epix on every platform, every authenticated platform. Uh, and all distributors are authenticating. All distributors are authenticating. And, and, and we're also, it's about choice. We're, we're pitching out, if, if my MVPDs want our linear feeds or they want 2,000 titles, we will pitch it to them so that they can put it in their ecosystem, in their MVPD app. So if, at the end of the day, it's about choice. The question is, uh, how do programmers navigate their deals, uh, protect their businesses, but at the same time, position themselves for growth going forward? And you've nodded. Epix has not gone direct to consumer. No, we're not direct to consumer. So if uh, I look at, in the last, call it, year and a quarter, yep. roughly, you've had HBO go direct to consumer, yep. 
Showtime sort of launched direct to consumer. Oh, they're direct to consumer. Yeah, but not heavily marketed. I mean, I don't think you really, you you, HBO has really put some ad dollars behind it. Uh, And then in very recent last few weeks, we've seen stars Stars, uh, go direct. So three of the four uh, leading pay TV, premium TV services have. Is there something unique to Epix that would make you not want to go direct? Uh, We really view the business a little differently. We're, We're in a different position than they are. Uh, HBO, Showtime, and Stars uh, have really maximized or capped out their MVPD penetration somewhere between 20 and 30 percent for the last many, many years. And, and as their corporate owners are trying to signal to the street that there's growth, they go direct to consumer. Epix is still growing in MVPD households. Our MVPD subs have grown by over 50% in the last 12 months alone. And just remind people, when did Epix get created? Epix was launched uh, six years ago. Uh, so you're still new. Yeah, we're absolutely still new. Uh, our growth is driven by partnering with our MVPDs and working with them uh, to uh, create new packages to, to operate as a more flexible uh, uh, premium and a better price value to the consumer. Uh, HBO, Showtime, and Stars are offered for $20 a la carte. Epix helps Time Warner Cable. Epix is offered in every one of their triple play acquisition offers. Uh, so that's what it's about. It's, it's about helping the MVPDs grow their subs beyond video households. It's about broadband. It's about wireless. Uh, we like to be in business with the likes of AT&T and DirecTV as opposed to going direct to consumer and getting onesies and twosies a la carte. Yeah. Mr. Gandler, you have a business that's trying to repackage yes. lots of existing broadcasting cable networks. I think Univision's one of your first partners. Yes, it is. Uh, by the end of the panel, we're going to get FUBU to take care of um, the team at Epix. Um, <laughs> yes, we will. We're committed to that. So We're almost done. Look uh, forward to it. <laughs> but no, but seriously, when we think about bundling, you're trying to rebundle. Um, if yes. I put into this thing, you are really the rebundling. You're, take, you're trying to take advantage of yes. this fragmentation of channels carving themselves off or even new startup channels. Correct. So, so for decades on, you've seen packages, well, networks, buy other networks, create media companies and just continue to stuff um, linear channels you know, into basic bundles. And you know, we look at this as an opportunity to reset the bundle. And even as a small company, I, I've gone in to see certain people and have said. I love the SEC network, by the way, in New York. It's really helpful. (laughs) Um, You know, we've gone in and have said, if you're not interested to do a deal with us today, there's a a very good chance that you will not get in. And that's a fact. And just because you were a leader yesterday doesn't mean you will be the leader uh, tomorrow. And so repackaging is critical. I think um, what's interesting about what we're doing is we're actually, we're really focusing on on a very different type of viewer. We're focused on a uh, male, 18 to 34 um, viewer who is sort of, you know, I, I like the cable space. I think it's a great space. I think the model's the right model. What I think is that, just like in cars, you have a 7 series BMW, you have a 5 series, and you have a 3 series. So for me, you know, our goal is to capture that 5 series space. And I think if I'm right, what you'll see is that eventually you'll have that cable bundle, which will stick if you have a family, a household of people that watch different content, it's high quality, um, you know, there's no buffering, there's, there's a lot of issues that still uh, we need to work through. On the low end, my, my guess is, and my bet is, that Netflix and Hulu, before this virtual MVPD announcement, will end up at the bottom, more sort of the, the three series, and the, the windowing strategy that you're seeing today uh, on digital will change to more of a sophisticated TV type syndication. Um, and that's, that's been our bet, and we are rebundling and taking networks that are in sports tiers and other tiers and bringing them into basic. But you don't have a network like ESPN today. I can say that we are in talks with all of the major players uh, today, uh, some of which have approached us, um, and we're, we're further along um, than we expected to be at this time. Um, we'll right. come back to that in a yeah. second. Uh-huh. Jamie, who... Um, who um, Helped create VHX, which is now part of Vimeo. Or shortly going to be part of Vimeo? As of last week, part of Vimeo. The deal's not closed, though, or is closed? The deal is closed. closed. can't announce it without Part of, without part of Vimeo. Mazel tov. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> He's got new shirts for everyone. Yeah. Um, you're trying to create lots of new channels. Um, 
basically help content creators develop their digital presence. I assume lots of your content theoretically could live in a FUBU world. Yeah, I think. FUBU platform, uh, or do you not think about it in that way? No, very, very much so. Uh, we built VHX to allow sellers, creators, uh, producers, studios, uh, you know, businesses of all shapes and sizes stand up their own SVOD OTT services, fully owned and operated, keep all the data, keep the relationships with the customers, which I have to like triple, triple underline because I think that that becomes one of our core differentiating uh, features. And historically, a lot of that content maybe wouldn't have had an outlet at all. It would have been stuff that people weren't interested in licensing or bundling because they weren't aware of it or they weren't familiar with the audiences that were out there for it. Um, but lots of it is stuff that currently is being licensed and people are interested in standing up their own services and reaching consumers directly. Um, and just reaching smaller audiences, I presume? I mean, really trying to target niche audiences? Generally speaking, yes. Um, there might be an argument to be made for what, you know, all audiences being niche in some capacity. No, but I guess what I'm getting at is how, how do you draw a line? I mean, if you look at something like Tastemade and what they've tried to do like on a Facebook or on um, on a Snapchat, how do you draw a distinction between what they're trying to do and what content creators are trying to do with VHX? Are they, are they the same or is it really a different push? It's very similar in philosophy and in the approach of sort of building a presence and building relationships with the consumer from your brand rather than producing content that you wholesale to someone else. Um, and and that, I think that's kind of the key difference that is possible now is that you can in fact stand up your own service and our promise is that you can do that talking about you know, tens of thousands of dollars instead of talking about hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars to do that. Um, where if you think about like, the analogy to a, real, like a, a, a retail environment or you're talking about having to buy space for these things, whereas that's now very cheap. Um, so it's opening up a lot of new opportunities more than, more than it's kind of taking away from uh, existing structures. And we've seen, I mean, this, I don't know who on the panel wants to start on this, but you know, we've seen um, what I would say, Glenn Beck went first. I mean, I think we were obsessed with the Blaze, yeah. not because I'm a big fan of the content of the Blaze, as much as I was focused on, they stepped out on the ledge, right? right. I mean, they, right. they were crazy enough to say, you know what, we mm -hmm. can create content, we don't need this ecosystem, I don't need Fox News's money. How many subs does he have? They reached 400,000 at, at the peak. I don't right. think they have 400,000 today. Oh uh, but they had a loyal, passionate group yeah. of people. And if you think about it, 400,000 people at $10 a month. Yeah, it's it's very similar if you think about Crunchyroll at 700,000 people uh, up from a few hundred thousand a few years ago sure. uh, at their whatever, eight or nine, $10 a month, I forget the number. Sure. Mm -hmm. But that's a real business. Yep. Uh, it's not a ESPN size business, but it's a real business. WWE's gotten to, I think today they reached a million eight, I want to say the WWE network has reached. But on the flip side, the, I would say the road is littered with failures. Lots of people who have tried this, and it hasn't worked. I mean, I don't sense CISO is blowing the doors off subscriber-wise um, on a pure ad platform. I don't think anyone's using Watchable. Go90, to me, seems literally you know, dead before it even started trying to create content. Are there learnings for like what works and what doesn't work? or is the reality that we really just need to be part of a bundle? I mean, you clearly set your view that the bundle is the future. I mean, is that fair that you Yeah, know, I mean, bundle, a, a, bundled need offering, a, a bundled offering, whether it's a multi-channel video household bundle or some combination of that with other subscription types as part of the MVPD ecosystem, certainly a, a much in, more interesting business proposition than, uh, than standalone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say, look, what, from what we've seen today, right, there, there, there have been different iterations. So the Blaze is talent driven. Um, you have the premiums that we talked about, HBO, Showtime, and Stars. I think it makes sense for some of them. It doesn't make sense for, for all of them, per se. Um, I mean, I think you wrote about it yourself, about Stars and the retaliation of Comcast not authenticating to the sure. app. That's a big reason why not to do it for some. Um, also, the, the breadth and depth of the content needs to be a little more robust, I would say. Um, separately, uh, for, the, for the others like CISO, you're seeing sort of this low-cost entry approach, $3.99 to, re, to, to the consumer, uh, get some strong library content that they have access to and round it out with you know, some minimal OP. Um, it, it's interesting. It looks like 
it looks like R&D to me. It looks, it's, it's a sexy business. Uh, direct to consumer is what everybody's talking about. Uh, whether it becomes a meaningful business or not, I, I'm doubtful. Um, but just like any other business, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the Wild West. They're all scrambling to gain, to gain share. Some will survive, some might consolidate, and probably a lot will shudder. Reggie, you've been probably one of the early players in going um, to new digital bundles. You know, if I think about Univision was early on getting into Sling and embracing Sling, um, you're, part, you know, you're part of FUBU from early on. Um, what do, you, what do you see in terms of what's the, what is a consumer of these packages? Are you reaching different consumers? Meaning, well, are these are the cord nevers that are saying, you know, like, this is great? Is this cord cutters who are saying, you know what, I'm tired of paying $80. I want to pay less, but I still want the content that I love. Who are these people? Well, you're always going to have the cord cutters mixed in there, any, any type of bundle. For us, uh, we have a kind of a different landscape being a Hispanic media uh, organization where Hispanics over index on technology, right? So, and, and they love their sports. So that, that for us is, is the intersection where we, we can play and, and give them their live sports now when, when they want it. That's, it's kind of getting away from the, from the court cutting. It's, it's to give them their content wherever they want it. So they care less about the quote unquote entertainment content. It's really about getting sports where they want it, when they want well, it. Sports is a big driver for us, yeah. And is that what you see when you look at usage across platforms like Sling and FUBU? People are using it so they can watch wherever they are. Sure, for the sports and as well as our prime uh, novella properties. We, we, our content is viewed very differently than English language. where we Explain. Have, we have a 90% live viewing. Where looking at English language networks, you know, they're like what, 60 or 50, even lower when you go to cable. Um, we, our novellas air five nights a week, so if you miss one episode, don't talk to anybody the next day, don't go on social media. That's why it's very important for us to get content to our consumers now so they're caught up and, and, and they can consume when they want. And do you see consumption across devices very different than a traditional English language platform? Meaning, are, are you much more mobile? Yeah, we're like over 80% mobile. We're mobile first, definitely. And when you think about um, this idea of the big cable bundle, we've still got 93 million people paying for this big bundle. Why? Value. Why has it not moved faster? What do you think stopping it? The value. You think value? Sure. I mean, you need that internet connection coming in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going to start bundling. It is definitely the value proposition. Do you think that changes over the next few years? I mean, do you think that 93 is 70 in five years, David? I think so. I think it sh it'll probably net out, net out around 65 to 70. I think that's that's. People fair. still have a bundle. We're not saying people are not, but you're, people are going to The gonna cable bundle itself. I the think cable we'll, company. The, cable the legacy company. distributors. Yes, legacy distributors. Will have a problem. much lower market share. Yes, for sure. And it's just because they don't have the DNA to do this digitally. And what I mean by that is, and you mentioned Go90. I'll just give you an example. So we charge $9.99 a month. And our two biggest properties are um, on the sports side, our Liga MX, which, which is from Univision, and our um, La Liga property, which is Spanish first division that carries uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona on a weekly basis. So Go90 has spent a ton of money in the marketplace and is giving it away for free. It is ad supported. Fubo TV is not ad supported and we charge $9.99 in first quarter. And you still have to watch ads. And you still have to watch ads because I'm, it's not ad free. Yes, it's, you're paying you're for a multi-channel right. video experience, exactly. and you're then watching ads like you would normally watch on TV. Right. So we're competing with these guys, obviously head to head. They have huge budgets uh, to spend, and you know we announced we're one of the only uh, private companies that announces their quarterly numbers every single month, and we announced 15,000 net additions for Q1, despite the fact that our two top properties are, are being offered for free. Um, on Go90. So I think this, what, what you'll see is that you really have to understand how to market this stuff. And it, you have to be very scrappy in doing it. So I, I find it, um, you know, and then there's other examples in the marketplace today where you could see that um, companies, large companies, are having a tough time figuring this out. The other piece is, that's critical is once you have a cable connection, you know, the churn rates are in the, you know, maybe 1% to 2% per month. So on an annualized basis, let's just say 10%. 
the new world is churn is here. Churn is here to stay. And um, if you don't understand how churn works and how to work with consumers throughout the, their, uh, their lifetime with you, you are just not going to be able to figure out uh, you know, how the lifetime value and how the metrics play in for you to be able to make this business successful. And to your point about CISO and some of these others, I mean, at $4.99, it's just unrealistic to make it a business from the onset uh, because you have uh, you know, merchant fees that you have to pay, which are pretty high up. Stripes, recurlies of the world are you know, charged roughly around 30 cents. Then you have your, your, you know, the fees you pay to the credit card companies. So then when you, when you tie in the cost to acquire a customer, which right now I've had an opportunity to work on two or three, um, and the cost to acquire customers, roughly about 50 to 60 bucks on a 499 product, so you can do the math. I mean, you need lifetime values of like 20, 25 months before these people churn out. So just looking at that alone, it is impossible. You know, and you quote so me you don't this. believe direct to consumer is viable? I think it's, it's not viable the way everyone wants to do it. You can't have every channel just go out there and create their own bundle. Now, as an I, I know you have views on this, but I want to get Jamie's <laughs> yeah. view. Because Jamie, first respond to that before we come back to good. this sure. whole concept. Because yeah. I know you have a different view. I assume you have a different view on direct-to-consumer. Well, I'm all about it. I'm just frantically writing down on these numbers, too. <laughs> <laughs> Fascinating. Um, uh, can I throw a question back yeah. to David? Is uh, that OK? Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, do you know, uh, what's your theory on why you guys grew 15K subs in Q1 despite 15,000 subs. 15,000. Uh, yeah, 50,000, we'd be, he'd be partying right Yeah, now. right. He uh, wouldn't be here. Give, give us a couple Des ones. Despite <laughs> not having sort of like uh, exclusivity. Yeah, ev everyone, I and mean, that's the cornerstone of what everybody wants to do. I need exclusivity, I need mm -hmm. original programming, and that's how I build. Well, let me interject for one thing. I spoke, at, I, I gave a lecture at Kellogg a few weeks ago mm -hmm. in Chicago, and I had 50 digital media business school students all highly focused on this, all these topics. And they were pummeling me with questions like we're pum I'm pummeling you. And I just asked them, you know, we were talking about different services. I said, what do you all think of Go90? Zero of 50 had ever heard of Go90. Zero. That's why Go90 just hired a new GM. So. That's true. Still early days. I do like Chip a lot. Yeah, you're a good guy. Still early days. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just, I was just curious, since it's something like, um, even, even using your analogy about, um, you know, Beamers, yeah. um, you know, the exclusive content, I take it, at, that's the 7 Series, right? That's the... Uh, this, uh, well, the cable experience itself is the 7 Series. You pay, you know, 150, 200 bucks uh, for a luxury vehicle. It's got 200 plus channels, local mm -hmm. sports, okay. uh, you know, DVR box like this that can hold, you know, movies for, I don't know how long, for ages. Um, and then all of these services that are attached to it. And that, to me, is luxury. Uh, mm -hmm. The next level down is having um, you know, a virtual MVPD experience where you're getting you know, premium content, some buffering. You don't get all the NFL games. You get half of them or a quarter of them. Um, you, know, you get some movies. You don't get everything. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of that middle ground where someone says, well, I can only consume three, four hours a week. I don't need everything. I can just you know, live off of the stuff that's here. Right. I mean, remember, only 30 million people have HBO. There's still right. 70 There's... million multi-channel households that don't mean, I know we live in a world where the thought of not having HBO is yeah, horrifying, yeah. but most people don't subscribe to HBO and Showtime. Right. And then the, and the last piece is just the fact that, you know, you're going to have a lot of this syndicated content, you know, your uh, Seinfelds, um, you know, some of these other shows that are great shows that people like to watch. And that's where I think the discovery piece comes in because you've kind of watched everything or you kind of know a lot of things, but you're not sure what you should watch next. And I think in those type of businesses, you, discovery is critical. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the linear experience, I don't know if it's completely dead because I have data that suggests otherwise. It's obviously not because every well, day we read, it, we read about a new virtual MVPD that's launching. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, because we're so sports focused and we launched our business on, on soccer properties, which uh, many of you may know, the season ends in May. So the first thing that happens is, you know, you start seeing ridiculous churn start happening on May 15th, and that will happen until roughly about August 5th, and then you'll see a huge skyrocket of users. What, what I've seen with Linear is that... You need that, to add New York Football Club. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> Just giving John Patrick off a shout-out. <laughs> um, but, you know, so what, what we've seen is that the Linear channels actually curb some of that churn because people still come back and say, okay, well, what's on, you know, Univision or, or be in sports and they check out what programming is there, whether it's news programming or 
or whatever. So I've seen at least um, from our business that, that, that it does curb churn. And well, it's, it's about not choice. Exactly. It's, it's linear and it's VOD. So, to the extent you can have both, even better. I, I do think the usage will shift more to the VOD part of those sure. two pieces over time, getting yeah. back to what Reggie was saying. I think it's, For sure. once you give people that choice, even the VMBPDs, you know, they may develop, but I think all of them, even Hulu last week, I mean, I think they were very clear on their messaging on stage. It yep. was the fusion of linear and on demand. It wasn't the There's focus. Cloud based DVRs. Yeah. It's, it's a well, hybrid experience. experience. I mean, you have little choice. If you have companies like Fubo that are going to have VOD anyway and have Gotham yeah. next day, and we have the linear stuff and the sports, then what happens to your service? So, um, you know, it's only a matter of time before they realize that they had to do both. You don't agree with the change in the ecosystem. You were you were shaking your head as he was talking. It's I don't think you're. you're I want gloves out. Yeah. So no. Boxing. Look. I, I, Let's go. Come on. Let's make some headlines. <laughs> we're certainly not going to 65 million MVPD households. I, I think if you take a structuralist view, look at no, the dynamics let's, let's, of the let's industry. No, but let's change the framing. Are we going to? If you took the currently, there's a hundred million households yeah. that take service from a Comcast, a Direct sure. TV. Could that number go to 65 and the no, that, remaining a, 35 be from new players? Right. So, so there's still 100 so the million answer, households. The answer is no. I, I think uh, if, you, if, if you look at multi-channel video households, the 100 million today or yep. whatever it is, 93, 98. Yeah, I don't it's know, 100 know. if you include skinny right. bundles. Uh, let's go with 100. 100, 100 million MVPD households. It's a highly concentrated industry that's only continuing to consolidate. You're sitting with... Comcast, you're sitting with DirecTV and now Time Warner and Charter who have immense leverage and it's a, it's a business about scale. And let's not forget that they also control broadband. So yeah. those that control those different subscription types, video, broadband, AT&T also having wireless, that is a powerful, powerful Agreed. tool in, in a business with leverage that has uh, negotiating leverage and buying power. Uh, separately, if you look at the other side of the spectrum, the suppliers of the programmers, as we all know, uh, the consolidation on the distribution side is happening. There may very likely be consolidation on the programmer side. Uh, and uh, in, in, in it's, it's, a, it's a function of scale. So while the, uh, the MVPD households uh, might be experiencing some limited cord cutting, I don't believe that that full migration, as you guys described, is going to accelerate uh, to the extent that you described. Now, I think the smaller MVPDs, certainly the uh, the ones in the uh, you know million subscriber, three million, the the lower smaller MVPDs without a lot of leverage, you might see some c additional consolidation there. You might see them exit the video business altogether, uh, and, and focus on their high margin broadband business. But but I don't. Do you think, think we're going to see the legacy distributors launch what I would call? You know, I guess we, you know, everyone loves the term skinny bundles. Yeah. Uh, we haven't really seen much in the way. We've seen new players like, you know, we've seen, you know, kind of dish launch slang. Sure. We've seen Verizon do custom TV. Mm -hmm. um, but we really haven't seen a wide array, especially from the legacy cable ecosystem, Charter, Time Warner, yep. well, no more Time Warner shortly, but Charter, Time Warner, Comcast. None of these companies have gotten into the skinny bundle game in a serious way. They've dabbled with it as save techniques, but they haven't really embraced it. Will that change? They're certainly looking at it, uh, as we know. I, I think the, uh, and, and you write about this a lot, the price value of that bundle yep. is, is broken. Uh, it impacts uh, the basic cable nets, I think, uh, most dramatically. Um, I'd Sm say- Smaller bundles are great for Epic. Absolutely. A, a, any, any type of subscription service is good for us. We're flexible. That's the good news. But the lower the cost of those packages. Sure, less of a buy-through. Absolutely. We get access to more people. Um, I would say, look, it, there are legacy media networks deals that are out there that are, that are going to prevent the, uh, the, the quick migration to skinnier bundles because mm -hmm. there are minimum penetration levels in these deals, as we know. Um, I would say that uh, it is important that the MVPDs uh, continue to get creative in their, uh, in their packaging um, so that they offer their consumers more choice. Um, I, I think one thing I read recently uh, that Rob Marcus said 80% plus of his new additions are still taking uh, a triple play offer. Sure. Uh, so I don't think it's going away, but, but I think it's... Although you can discount your ways into very creative uptake of new... 
sure. new packages. And you're still seeing video ads, uh, video subs being posted by the Comcast. Sure. They don't make as much news because that's not the sexy story. No, but, but they're, they're, also they're also doing things where, you know, Dish's numbers include slang, or Comcast numbers include their stream subscribers. And so there's only smaller numbers in there. But I wanted to come back to, because I think you mentioned the word creative packaging. And Reggie, you kind of were alluding to this. Do you think we get to a point where you're seeing video packages that actually have Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or, you know, Jamie, name a few of your uh, networks? I mean, you know, David's packages right question. now are traditional cable and broadcast networks. We haven't seen, you know, I'm thinking of like Disney added Maker yeah. TV to Sling. Do you think we start to see over-the-top content be bundled in? I think so. I think, didn't Cablevision just announce Hulu? Now is on like a... It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an a la carte add-on though. Right. We've never seen anyone included as part of a, a, a you know, again, you, I think the word is great, creative packaging. We haven't seen creative packaging. I think there are pro programmer prohibitions in those deals that wouldn't allow them to go cannibalize their MVPD business. Uh, so I think less so, and I think that uh, Hulu's Cablevision deal certainly is interesting, but I think as Hulu goes virtual MVPD, that's probably less likely as well. Yep. Uh, Comcast doesn't allow Netflix on the set-top box. Uh, uh, I, I believe Amazon, I'm sure, has, has certain prohibitions, whether it's set-top box prohibitions on a permitted device basis or, or, or rebundling or reselling of content deals. So I, I think there are barriers to, to that happening. I think with smaller guys, smaller MVPDs who are trying to, who prioritize their broadband business over their video business, are selling that and doing app installs. Certain MVPDs use TiVo as their standard set top box. Uh, and for them, that's a broadband play. It's not about growing the video business. Do you think we'll see some of the content that you create flow into these bundles? Jamie? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's certainly going to be creative. I mean, it's actually... <laughs> Maybe give people an idea. People may not be familiar with the types of content that you've started to develop in yeah. terms of channels. Yeah. Uh, I mean, transactionally, over the last five years, we've sold a lot of kind of uh, comedy specials and independent films and uh, web series and hunting shows and yoga videos and instructional videos. And then some of the OTT networks that we've been standing up, like some of my favorites recently are like Yoga with Adrian, which is just a dedicated yoga network built around a single personality. Uh, or we just relaunched Megahertz Choice, which is international uh, you know, crime and mystery shows that are a subtitle in English and brought to the US. Akin and, to what Amazon announced today? Or uh, somewhat, or not? Or? We're in the same uh, category, certainly, although that's Amazon's cribbing you? Yeah, yeah, learning from, learning from the little guys. Um, in the, in the conversation around all of this, I always can't help but point out the fact that everybody keeps trying to defend the cable sub numbers. And, and it reminds me so much of the conversation around publishing five years ago or 10 years ago or music 15 years ago where everybody's like, no, 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 it's still healthy, it's still healthy. But uh, if you look at cable, cable sub churn by age group, it's just the writing is on the wall. Young people, it's double digit declines year over year. It is this cord never phenomenon where even asking me the question of like, do you believe in direct consumer? It's what other option is there if people aren't subscribing to these traditional bundles anymore? And to try to deny that is just kind of. Uh, I saw the stats yesterday. Season to date, broadcast TV, 18 to 34, was down double digits. It, right. And it has been for, for years. But, right. The, you start to multi-year stack those numbers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and Hispanic's obviously a different animal because it's got different do drivers and different content. But it's certainly the English language broadcast networks are literally getting crushed. Well, you're and, not seeing the whole picture either when you're looking at the ratings. And that's right. what Nielsen's that's working on. So let's not forget that. I, I don't think the question is whether direct-to-consumer is like happening or not, or it's, it's a question of whether that's going to be a viable business for, mm. for, uh, for certain programmers. I mean, I, I think from some of the new entrants, if they can, to your point, it's interesting. It's a low cost of entry. Um, subscription is a great business for those guys. Uh, it's an alternative it, to... If you reset the framework of you don't need to hit 50 million households. Right, exactly. You don't have to be You, Netflix, you can break right? even at 100,000 paid subs. Like, right. that's a nice little business. But... It's not a meaningful business, right? So I, I think you're looking at different market segments also. It's yeah, not, you, it's not think, one or the other. Yeah, I, I think you also have to understand that we also don't require the same profit margins that DISH requires. So even though, and I'm going to tell everybody in this room, I pay 30% more 
right, than any MVPD does. And I will gladly do that. And I will pay more, 10% more per year. I made this announcement public before because I can handle it. These other guys have. Let's do a deal. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> He's got low overhead. I've been to his office. <laughs> trust me. Office. I trust me. His and, overhead and, is low. And, and one of the things we're doing is we're also doing this globally. Like most digital it's companies, awesome, right? the idea is can we create scale globally so that in certain markets we can be more effective? And so I think that piece that you're saying doesn't make sense for a programmer. I would say there's nothing wrong with taking you know, a $10 sub in cable and having them transfer over to a virtual MVPD and get $15 or $14. To me, that seems like a, a you know, great move. And you're probably right. There's, you know, there's going to be a lot more virtual MEPDs. But I think to deny the fact that, um, you know, that this is, these are viable businesses and that these are, are serious alternatives to uh, the cable industry, I think it would be a mistake. And the other yeah. thing I would, I would note, and this came from your blog, which I thought was quite interesting, was the, um, you had a chart a couple weeks ago about mobile broadband penetration. Yeah. And what I would say is if you think cable companies are safe, I go back to BlackBerry. They thought they were safe and Apple was a toy um, you know, in 2008. Um, and the, the fact that mobile broadband is, is growing in homes, and it works very well. In fact, trees don't fall on poles, and I, you know, I have cable vision. Um, sometimes it's out. Any storm, any snow, any something, and, and, and you, know, you lose your, uh, your, your, your internet connection. So I think that you have to look at all of these variables. And what I always tell my board, and I have four media companies on my board now, I, would, I always say to them, this is happening in real time. And anybody who thinks that they know what's going to happen right. is clearly mistaken. And the way our approach to this is, let's not make any decisions and let's take each day by day and figure out how to navigate through these headwinds. But I think there will be a lot of change going forward and it's absolutely impossible to know who's going to win. The consumer seems like a winner. Is that fair? Do we all agree on that? From Are you going to end up with yeah, you know, more for less, or do you think you actually end? I mean, if I take a lot of the legacy media executives, they'll say, well, without our ecosystem and the $80 bundle and everyone paying in, all of this great content won't get created. I think the consumer is absolutely the winner. I mean, uh, there are more options than ever from a distribution standpoint, more services, mm -hmm. that is. Uh, and there are more, the, the content's better than ever. I mean, at least, at least. I on may the, not get naked and afraid uh, on Discovery, though. Yeah, at least on the TV <laughs> side. I mean, we've all seen the FX study. I mean, 409 scripted yep. series last year. There's a lot of good TV on. So whether that's accessible through basic or through premium or through an OTT service, I think at the end of the day, it's great for the consumer. What happens to advertising? You're ad free, so you're, you're, you're not quiet. answering this yeah, question. Uh, you can certainly give your views in a second, but what happens to advertising? Because right now, FUBU um, yeah. or Univision on Slang, um, it's a very similar experience to what I get today turning on Time Warner Cable in New York, despite the fact that you know exactly who I am, where I live, and what I watch, mm -hmm. correct? I assume you track all the data of yes, everything do. I'm doing. Yes, we do. So, you know, don't tell them too much. I'm not going to say too much, but what I will say is that we were really worried when we launched uh, last year on January 8th because the concern was nobody wants ads. And I came from a VOD service uh, prior to this that was acquired uh, by Warner Brothers recently. Um, and the fear was you have 12 minutes of commercial time per hour, right? 48 minute show, 12 minutes of commercial time. I can tell you there were absolutely no complaints. And we can get as high as to 70,000 concurrents during a specific show that we're marketing. So um, you know, people are not really complaining as long as the price is right. And currently at 9.99, I, th I think we're an add-on to you know, a Netflix, to a cable bundle, to, to many different things. So I think it, it kind of works. Um, but do you get programmers? I mean, you have programmers on your board. Yes. They were go, why are we running 20 minutes of ads per hour? Why don't we show the right ad to the right person and just, you know, it, it, it's amazing how little, we were talking about how TV hasn't changed. Advertising is, the fact that we're still talking 30 second spots. Google lets me skip an ad if I don't like it. Facebook lets me skip an ad if I don't like it. Snapchat, I just swipe past it. TV, I'm still in a world of 18 minutes of ads per hour that are just kind of there. Well, we, sh we should all know and remember that, you know, there are quarterly earnings calls and you got to deliver against your numbers. So it's, it's tough to kind of wean off of that right away. No, but theoretically, if you know exactly who I am, you could deliver me on FUBU right, so the perfect ad. On our platform, yes, that is the case. And we're integrating Freewheel, which we will be launching, um, you know, within the next 
quarter, I believe. But, and that we will have that type of targeting um, capability. But I think that overall, the 30-second spot, again, I'm an old ad guy. I started in local broadcast television. It works. It works well. And when I talk to friends of mine that are you know, in these YouTube channels or MCNs, it's tough to you know, create content for every advertiser, for your unique platform. I mean, it's, it's just unrealistic to you know, go to Tastemade, create some you know, food recipe thing, then you go to Whistle Sports and then have something like sports oriented. How do you run campaigns when you're an AT&T or a Verizon where you have you know, Black Friday, Christmas specials? You know, it, it's just it's really complicated. I think targeting is probably the best way and, and messaging that's created for specific demographics you know, for scale works. I mean, this is a scale business, as you said earlier. Sure. And we need but to the kind scale of, you're reaching is getting smaller and smaller, which is the challenge, right? Right. But you can get that scale across different properties, right, when you're targeting the right people and you're sending them the, that, that message. And it doesn't necessarily have to take place in a specific uh, channel. Jamie, is advertising interesting for the channels you've launched, or is transactional really far, and subscription far more interesting? Uh, we got our roots in transactional, moved into subscription. Advertising, AVOD support is absolutely on the table. Um, we're interested in helping people make more money and build successful businesses. Uh, however they choose to do that is, is in a lot of ways up to them. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I think it depends on the style of content in a, lot of, in a lot of cases, like to that point around exclusivity versus non-exclusivity or how mass available something is. Um, but it's not my forte, so I don't want to delve. And TV Reggie, you live in a TV everywhere world where you've launched a lot of experiences direct to, or not direct to consumer, but accessible by consumers as part of their bundled they experience. Have a, they have one direct to consumer brand. Yes, we do. They do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you want to talk about it? <laughs> uh, sure. We, and uh, what you see on that? Is that ad supported? Yes, it's actually, it's Univision now, so it's our version of CBS's All Access. Mm -hmm. um, so we have our two broadcast networks, uh, the, the feed on there. Um, we are actually the second network to go Nielsen rated for digital, and that's starting at the end of the month. And so you run the same ads that appear on TV, run yes. on Univision now? Yep, so when you launch Univision now here, you get our, our uh, New yep. York affiliate right on your tablet or on your phone. So it, it's the same experience. And what do you do for the local? You run the same local affiliate ads? Yep, yes. Cool. Do you guys have plans to offer ad-free tiers? Out of curiosity, I'll... Uh, Hulu? Not, not that I know. No. I wouldn't do that, yeah. ever. <laughs> Just yeah. one comment. CBS. For the non advertising. CBS guy. showed great earnings, didn't they? They did. To the financial analyst, right? So what, what do you attribute to that? Um, look, I think part of it is, is that um, the reality is, is you have nobody really wants to upset the apple cart, right? It's very hard to want to, you know, disruption is hard to do. Right. Uh, and so right now, everyone is kind of selling to the traditional ecosystem, as well as monetizing to third parties like sure. Netflix and Amazon and Hulu. And um, so everyone's getting kind of, is almost in many ways double dipping. Right. You're getting benefits from the new and the old ecosystem, but yet consumer behavior is shifting. Absolutely. To me, ratings are the leading indicator of everything. Because right. mm -hmm. as eyeballs shift, ultimately, money spent, consumers won't spend money on whatever it is. They'll shift to a Univision now. They'll shift to something, yep. ultimately, if they're using something. They're not going to just out overspend for something they're not using. Right. And so that'll be the ultimate telltale sign. I think advertising, we're in a transitional phase. I, my, my gut is, is just, it's early, right? I mean, you know, we think about mobile video being this huge category, and it is relative to where it was. I mean, if you look at Facebook's revenues last quarter, they grew by essentially two Viacoms. I mean, literally, they added almost two billion of revenue. Amazing. Yeah. And Viacom's ad revenue in a quarter is one billion. So if you just right. think about the scale. But remember, Facebook didn't do any video. Remember, no one in this audience was uploading content, video content to Facebook before the Ice Bucket Challenge in August of 14. Right. So that's just, I mean, Think about it, in the scheme of this, you're a six-year-old business. Yeah. Facebook video yeah. monetization is, you know, call it 18 months old. It's right. crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. So, yeah. I mean, I think part of it is just moments in time, right? I mean, Absolutely. Re reaching, quote-unquote, Super Bowl-sized audiences is still relatively new on, on mobile and digital platforms. Right. Snapchat Discover didn't even exist, you know, 15 months ago. So, I think part of it is just timing. 
I think there's a shift, but you, you can feel it. I think, you know, Jamie was mentioning before, there's no doubt that something's happening sure. now. And this, it feels like there's a rush for everybody to get in on uh, doing some form of content aggregation. Yeah. And I think part of it is everyone spends so much time watching TV. People want to figure out a way to monetize TV and participate in that ecosystem. Sure, for sure. One topic we didn't talk about is how does everyone think about Netflix? So you compete with Netflix. Yeah. Are they a tough competitor? Do you? Well, they were one of our biggest customers for a long time. Uh, we we took, you know, they, they 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 moved into the exclusivity business, and as a result, uh, we did a deal with Hulu instead. Uh, I we look at, and also Netflix. I, and is your content working really well on Hulu? Absolutely, and we window it differently. So we have explain a, to everyone what that means. We have an MVP. The MVPDs uh, get access to our titles in an earlier window than, uh, than our SVOD deals. Uh, and, and our SVOD partners still see tremendous value in the title. So it's really driven by the content type. Uh, we have exclusive first-run movies, and that helps sell subscriptions. Uh, but I, what I would say is I think Netflix's strategy has changed. Netflix early on was also positioning, was it an MVPD? Was it a network? What is it? Today, it's made the decision, it seems to be, that it, that it looks, it's, it's, a, it's a premium. It's, it's a new age premium network. It's a subscription service that can go global. Focus, they just got the Disney output deal from Stars. They control yep. the pay one window for Disney. Um, it's a premium, and now they're heavily investing in originals. Uh, which is different than the Hulu model, which is taking more of a distributor model, uh, especially with their virtual MVPD announcement. Uh, I think we're out of time. Any other last comments? I guess why don't we just do one last uh, question uh, before we break. Um, if you could design the ultimate video bundle, what would it be? <clears throat> That's a good question. Especially since you're designing one. <laughs> I mean, don't screw this up. <laughs> it's a very tough question. We talk about this every day. Um, you know, we're focused on a particular type of customer, and the bundle that we're building is really for a very young male-oriented, you know, viewer, and it's heavily sports skewed, uh, heavily regional sports, um, with a layer of national sports and, and movies. And hence, we should have our discussion afterwards. I look forward to it. So that's how, that's what we're thinking. Jamie. Uh, I'm uh, building a platform for other people to build their own bundles because I have no idea. Uh, for me, the, the ultimate bundle would be uh, with the opening up of the set-top box. Um, I think it's going to open up worlds that we've never seen before because now you can get your box from Roku or from, from who knows and, and watch your, again, your linear channelized experience. Maybe my remote won't have A, B, C, D buttons on it. Right. For reasons I don't even understand. Right. <laughs> Seriously, that, that's, that's going to, I think, really take everything and marry it together and really create the ultimate viewing experience. New and old. Yes. One that includes epics. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> Not really. Uh, it's, it's about choice. It's about choice. I, I don't know what the right channel configuration is. I think everybody's trying to figure it out. Um, something that has good price value from a license fee to ratings perspective, certainly. Um, but uh, it's about choice and flexibility. Thank you all very much. It was great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.